Just as the Great Calamity utterly destroyed the Kingdom of Hyrule, burning the country to ash, Breath of the Wild itself burned down many Zelda conventions, from traditional dungeons and item progression to companions and heart pieces. But now that we're building on these foundations with an upcoming sequel, perhaps some of the older game features and mechanics can be reintroduced to the series, fit to match the new style. A few months ago, I talked about things I'd love to see return in Breath of the Wild's upcoming sequel, like Ganondorf's trident, Sheik, and a gear upgrade system. But these aren't the only things I'm hoping to see next time we get a glimpse of Breath of the Wild 2, whenever that is. The same's true for you guys, who left a huge amount of comments detailing mechanics, characters, locations, and more that you're hoping to see return for Link's second adventure through the wilderness. So subscribe if you haven't already for more Zelda content, and let's follow up on the first wish list and run through some game mechanics and features I'd love to see return for Breath of the Wild 2. Despite the desolation, Breath of the Wild's Hyrule teems with life. Fauna from insects to rhinoceros, both mundane and magical. Moose, dogs, fairies, and dragons. One of the most useful of Hyrule's creatures is the horse, which Link can of course tame and ride, registering different steeds at the various stables across the world, giving him easy access to quicker travel. However, Link can also use some less orthodox animals as mounts. Deer, bears, even lynels, sort of. Riding a deer is required for a shrine quest, and riding a bear is just awesome, but otherwise, these alternate mounts are far less useful than a horse. Even the mystical Lord of the Mountain, a divine horse-like spirit with infinite stamina, is incredibly impractical as a regular mount, as it can't be stored at a stable. However, with Breath of the Wild's upcoming sequel, we can see Link and Zelda make use of an alternate mount a giant horned beast, which Zelda is seen riding at one point. The beast is covered in packs and storage, seen carrying useful items like firewood, an axe, a sleeping bag, a lantern, torches, and even cooking equipment. Alternate mounts to the standard horse have appeared throughout the Zelda series. An obvious example is Skyward Sword's loft wings, allowing Link to traverse the skies but a more fitting example of this would be Twilight Princess's Bulbos, normally ridden by Bulblins. If the Bulblins are killed, Link can actually mount the Bulbos, which are incredibly difficult to control, but monstrously powerful, able to smash through structures which are normally almost impossible to destroy. This power charge gives Link an incentive to use Bulbos over Epona in certain situations. Whereas in Breath of the Wild, mounting animals like bears has no real benefit. But if the Beast of Burden seen in the sequel isn't just limited to this cutscene, but can actually be ridden in-game, it's probable that it'll serve a purpose that a horse can't, providing some sort of storage or illuminating dark caverns with mounted torches. If this is the case, perhaps it isn't the only useful mount Link will be able to tame in the sequel. Time travel is one of the Zelda series' most iconic mechanics, used of course most famously as the central plot device in Ocarina of Time, but it's also used brilliantly elsewhere. Like Twilight Princess's Temple of Time, the cyclical structure of Majora's Mask, the Gates of Time in Skyward Sword, or using the Harp of Ages. Breath of the Wild, a game set in a world reduced to ruins by a cataclysmic event, seemed like the perfect stage to introduce a time travel mechanic, allowing for exploration of Hyrule before the fall, but the game stayed set in the post-apocalyptic wilds. Thematically, this decision to lock Link into the wilderness without including a time travel mechanic makes sense as it turns the focus on solving the mystery of what happened a century ago onto Link. Instead of just travelling back and witnessing it, it becomes a journey of self-discovery and remembrance. Additionally, it makes the events of the Great Calamity all the more brutal, with no way to temporarily revert the ruination via travelling back through time. 
But with the introduction of what appears to be the tortured, reanimated body of Ganondorf himself, Breath of the Wild 2 looks set to explore the history of the Calamity Ganon, looking backwards rather than forwards. Perhaps the history of Hyrule, a story tied to the eternal hatred of the Calamity Ganon, isn't a closed book, and will explore the origins of the beast. If this is the case, then time travel would be a perfect way to explore Hyrule's past. Perhaps not in the massive, dual world way that Ocarina of Time does, perhaps only in the limited capacity used in Skyward Sword. Skyward Sword of course features the Gates of Time, allowing Link to walk between two different eras, such as when he follows Girahim and Zelda to the ancient past for the final battle. The Gates of Time are great ways to connect different time periods, but a far more unique mechanic exists in the game, the Time Shift Stones mysterious crystals mined in the Lineru Desert. A Time Shift Stone is an incredibly powerful tool. If Link strikes one, the area immediately surrounding it is reverted backwards through time, forming a sort of bubble of the past. This affects not only the land, but the inhabitants too. If a Time Shift Stone is struck, decrepit, broken robots and systems are restored to life. As Link, while inside the Time Shift bubble, is technically in the past. Even the powerful thunder dragon Lanayru, who is found in the present as a skeleton, succumbed to an illness, can be visited in the past using a time shift stone, and healed with a life tree fruit. Time shift stones make for some incredibly innovative gameplay, affecting the story, puzzles, and even combat. They're one of my favorite mechanics in the series, and I'd love to see something similar reintroduced in Breath of the Wild sequel. Of course, one of the biggest mysteries presented by the 2017 game, also seen prominently in the sequel trailer, is the strange ruins of the Zonai tribe. Ancient pillars, temples, and labyrinths of carved stone, built by a people who vanished suddenly in the distant past. Using time shift stones could not only give Link a means of exploring these ruins and uncovering the mysteries of the tribe, but even have uses in the overworld. We know that the Zelda team intend to reuse Breath of the Wild's Hyrule, at least in part, for the sequel, and one of the big questions surrounding this decision is how exploration will feel fresh and exciting in a world we've seen before. A unique solution to this problem would be allowing us to revert ruins to their original state temporarily, allowing Link to interact with long-dead characters to unlock the mysteries of the past. Even little, seemingly insignificant ruins, like these charred wooden beams near Kakariko Village, would be incredibly interesting to explore in the past with a time shift stone. Was this once a bomb shop which detonated when attacked by guardians, taking out all three of the assaulting machines with it? Breath of the Wild is, unarguably, the most massive, breathtaking game in the Zelda series. But despite its gigantic scale, there are elements that feel a little underpolished. A lack of enemy variety, non-shrine side quests, and strangely, the title screen. The 3D Zelda title screens are often designed to set the mood of the games, like the Wind Waker's bright panning shots of sunny Outset Island, Twilight Princess's epic choir theme, fittingly during sunset, and Majora's Mask's surreal, dreamlike visions of the mask itself, followed by shots of Clock Town with a slow, somber version of the town's theme. But, in my opinion, all of these pale in comparison to what I still think is the greatest title sequence in a video game, Ocarina of Time, which has Link riding a pona across Hyrule Field at dawn, alone, with the beautiful, slow piano theme playing. A strangely somber, lonely opening in contrast to the bright and happy Kakiri Forest where we begin the adventure, but it's a tone that becomes more and more prominent as you progress through the game. Even Skyward Sword, which has the least dynamic title screen of the 3D games, is still effective. Simply the game's logo, set among clouds, with the sound of the wind. But Breath of the Wild, it's a simple game menu on the right, logo in the corner, with different pieces of official artwork cycling through, with no music. Even just adding footage from one of the game's trailers, like I've done here, in my opinion makes a more effective title screen. 
seeming less synthetic than the original does. I mean, it says a lot about how good the actual game is that one of my only major gripes with it is just the title screen, but it's something I hope Breath of the Wild's sequel changes, introducing something more dynamic, especially with the game's dark, unsettling tone. The Hinox is one of the most charismatic, animated bosses in the series so far. Found asleep in their giant dens, scratching themselves and with a bubble of saliva the size of a melon, Hinoxen only engage Link when he disturbs their slumber, waking and pulling entire trees from the earth to use as weapons, as well as punching, kicking, or attempting to sit on the hero. Despite their incredibly unique design, they're not original enemies. Hinoxen have appeared in the series as early on as A Link to the Past, still Cyclopean giants, but not to the same extent. The Lionel is a similar example of an older Zelda enemy, redesigned into an incredibly well-polished, characterful monster, and I'd love to see this trend continue in Breath of the Wild's sequel. So this entry on the list is actually a feature I'd love to see return from Breath of the Wild itself. I've covered this topic in the past, but I'd absolutely love the game to feature classic Zelda enemies like Iron Knuckles, Dodongos, Redeads, Helmosaurs or Tektites with reimagined designs, made with just as much polish and innovation as the Lionel and the Hinox. Especially if there's a focus on dark caverns and exploring Hyrule's forgotten underworld, Gibdos, Skulltula, Wallmasters, or even something like Dead Hand would be fitting enemies to reinvent. If Breath of the Wild was designed to go back to the roots of the series, to the unrestricted open world exploration, described by Miyamoto as a garden in your drawer, that made the 1986 original so groundbreaking, then will its sequel go the way of Adventure of Link? completely redesigning the core gameplay and overworld. Hopefully not, but Zelda 2 absolutely features some of the most unique and interesting mechanics in the series, like magic. Magic is one of the stranger mechanics in the Zelda series. Its attendance record isn't great. It appeared heavily in most of the games prior to Twilight Princess, but hasn't properly been seen since and in most games it's only used as a means to limit the use of other items, like the Deku Leaf or Magic Armor in The Wind Waker, the Goddess Spells or a couple of other items in Ocarina of Time, or a few of the more powerful items in A Link to the Past, to name just a few. But Adventure of Link treats magic entirely differently. Zelda 2 has a slew of unique mechanics which never truly appeared again in the series, but perhaps the most significant was its magic system allowing Link to cast spells with varying effects, from increasing his defense or agility, to healing him or casting fireballs, even transforming him into a fairy or calling down lightning upon his foes. Despite this magic system only appearing in Zelda 2, Breath of the Wild actually featured a somewhat similar system, with two different main sets of abilities. With the Sheikah Slate, Link has access to runes, primarily Bombs, Magnesis, Cryonis, and Stasis, all serving as unique tools. And with the Champion's abilities, Link has access to four spell-like abilities, Resurrecting from Death, a Magical Defensive Parry, Summoning an Upward Wind, and Calling Down Lightning, just like Adventure of Link's Thunder. So, in essence, Breath of the Wild already featured a system like Adventure of Link's Magic or at least came closer to it than any other game in the series. Just like how lower level spells required less magic power, and can therefore be cast more frequently than higher level spells, runes like bombs require a smaller cooldown than runes like stasis, and the incredibly powerful champion's abilities can only be used three times before a long cooldown period. So while I'd love to see a real magic system at some point, I think that simply expanding upon a central mechanic of the original game, the Sheikah Slate's runes, would be a brilliant addition to the sequel. New runes, maybe unlocked in underground forgotten shrines, could introduce new mechanics, like one that illuminates pitch black caves, or one that creates magical tethers between objects. 
The Sheikah Slate is an incredibly versatile yet beginner friendly item. Essentially a spellbook, map, companion and guide all rolled into one. And I don't think we've seen it used to its full potential yet. Thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, leave a like or subscribe if you haven't already for more Zelda content. Cheers guys, and I'll see you next time.